Okay, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, it's our pleasure to have uh, our invited speaker, Angela Govila, to give a talk on product management 101. Uh, before we get started, first of all, uh, this talk is recorded. And uh, for most of the attendees, uh, in order to talk during, uh, during the talk, you have to raise your hand and then someone will switch you into the panelist mode, then you can start to unmute and talk. And uh, also you can ask your, uh, send your questions through either chat or Q&A, and then uh, someone will, uh, will, will then uh, tell the speaker about uh, the question. Uh, and then uh, I will let Angela introduce herself because she graduated from Penn State I I I IST so we treat her as one, one of us. Uh, Angela, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. So excited to be talking to you all today. Um, so I graduated in 2005 from ISD. And as I was catching up with Dr. Wang before this, um, you know, I, I wanted to take everybody to a little bit of uh, mem jogging everybody through memory lane. So when I decided to join the program of ISD, the program of ISD it was still called the school of um, information science and technology. And it was in one of the older buildings uh, on the Penn State campus is where, you know, I met with um, Stan Supon, who was the assistant dean, and he convinced me this was the right course for me to take. I actually joined Penn State in the College of Engineering back in 2003 and switched over. And um, as I started thinking about what do I want to talk to you all about today, and, you know, I graduated a while back. It's been 17 years since I graduated. I've been in the workforce since then, and I've had very fortunately, an amazing career. I love my job, and I'm going to talk about it in a little bit. But um, just reflecting back to how far the the organization has come was just um, amazing to think about. So I found a picture from back in 2005. Um, ISC was represented at Khan, and these are um, my you know um, friends from ISC who are now in different parts and different uh, organizations and. Um, the four of us represented IITC back in 2005, and that year in Khan, we raised $4 million. And just this past you know, month, Feb 2022, Khan raised $13 million. So you can imagine how far we've come. This was hosted in the rec hall, if you recognize the building, and now it's hosted at Bryce Jordan Center. So just thinking about in context of how much um, the School of ISC has now grown into the College of ISC and now has different options of majors. When I was a student, it was just one major with different concentrations, and now there's multiple options, right? You could do data science, you could do cybersecurity. So I just love how much we've evolved. And in the last few years, I've had the opportunity to get involved with um, the scholarship program and also the Dean's Advisory Board. So I'll it just feels wonderful to be able to give back to the community. And I would just, um, my you know, best piece of advice would be just utilize all the things that ISC has to offer to you because there's a lot of people thinking about the students and their future. And this is just one great example, right? I get to talk about my work that I've, my passion for it grew over the last decade, but my foundations that I got at ISC is really what um, got me to this point. So uh, today we're gonna talk about product management. And before I get there, I'm going to just put a few disclaimers out. And as we go along, I did say this to, um, you know, to Dr. Wang and Mike and Sam as well, is I would love for this to be interactive. And so please pause, raise your hand, ask questions. You will get more value out of this the more you ask and engage. And offline, after this is done, please feel free to find me on LinkedIn. I'm um, active on LinkedIn. I'm happy to help you in any which way as you progress from your time at ISC into blossoming careers. So the disclaimer really is um, that this is just my point of view and my point of view has developed uh, over a 17 year work experience at this point. So my internship was at Verizon Wireless. I ended up doing um, nine months of co-op with them while I was a student. And I think that was just such a wonderful experience to, to know what I'm gonna get into the workforce when I graduate. Um, I joined GE as part of the Information Management Leadership Program uh, right out of school, and then moved to Ernst & Young, um, where I got to practice my strategic consulting jobs, and then joined Capital One, and now I'm with JP Morgan Chase. So those are the four companies I worked with in the last um, 15 or so years. And so when I talk about 
you know, product management is from lengths of actually launching products in the industry and largely focused in financial services. And these are digital banking products is what I've done in the last decade. But your mileage will vary from the conversation today. And the more you engage and the more you ask questions, I think the principles we talk about today, you can go apply to any type of digital product. Um, and as I talk about the examples today, just know these are fictitious examples. Um, I have, you know, I'm going to talk about Facebook and Google and the Silicon Valley companies. I have not worked there. So this is just an outsider's perspective of what I see and what I observe from the different trainings I've attended and what I've seen in actual execution. Um, so this is where the interaction begins. Um, I'm going to ask you all a question. You have to tell me if all of these things that show up on the screen are they products. And I wish, I don't know how to bring the chat up. You're getting a lot of yeses. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Pam. So um, we've got a cup of iced coffee with whipped cream. We've got a straw. We've got ice cubes. We've got the actual cup. We've got the actual coffee. All of these things make the product, right? But when you go to Starbucks or your favorite coffee shop, if it happens to be tea, you don't really care about how this entire packet is put away. That first sip is what really, really is what you want, right? Like that feeling you get when you have that first sip. It's that experience that you have. And right in the middle here, we've got different, you know, logos here, which I think for a lot of people can guess. There's Twitter, there's WhatsApp, there's uh, Google, there's YouTube. All of these are products as well. These are things that you interact with as a user. Uh, and they have, these companies have millions of users. And then on the right side, we've got a laptop an iPhone or any type of phone, you know, uh, or a product. So what I am going to talk about today is specifically digital products. We work in technology. You're studying technology. This is the backbone of society of how we can progress. So let's talk about what are some of the things that are software-based that you absolutely love. And if someone can tell me what you're seeing on chat, that would be awesome. So we have somebody, uh, Benjamin says Twitter. Cool. Snapchat, we have from Cameron. Yep. TikTok from Lauren, Twitter, AirPods, Apple Music, Instagram. There you go. Yeah, the list goes on. Thank you, Sam. So, <laughs> terrific. And Google Maps, no one said that, but that's one that, or Apple Maps, if you happen to be an Apple fan. Um, fantastic. And as you think about, these products, why do you love them? Why did you pick up, you know, TikTok or Snapchat or Instagram as your favorite product? What is it about it that you really love? So raise your hand if you'd like to answer Angela. I'm putting stuff in the chat. Um, so the answers are user experience, stay up to date, convenience, best way to communicate with people, interaction, easy to use. Spot absolutely apply. spot on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely spot on. Thank you, Pam. And it's addictive. Yeah. That's what somebody else said. And it's addictive. <laughs> and you know what? There's somebody thinking about all these things as they're building the product. You know, they're thinking about how do they make it user friendly? How do you make it easy to use? How do I make sure this user keeps coming back? which is the addictive side of it, and they call it engagement, right? These are phrases of, like the, the word engagement really means is how do I get you to use my product? Um, and you start off with customer experience, right? So everything is about, as we think about that cup of coffee that we talked about on the first slide, you translate that to a, you know, a digital product, it's the same exact thing. What's that experience like when I'm using it? And so when you think about um, how to build these products, what we're going to actually talk about today is very specifically digital product management. I'm not going to talk about how to manage, you know, like if you're selling lotion and if you work for a consumer goods product, how do you manage that? I don't have any experience in that space, but I can tell you how to build a digital product and how do you grow that digital product. So today's conversation is very much focused on that. And um, does anybody want to take a stab at what are some of the things you think about? when you want to build 
a digital product. So imagine you're building, a, you know, Instagram. What are some of the things somebody who works for Instagram is thinking about? And I would actually love if folks want to go off mute and just talk about your thoughts. That would be great. Ian, you raised your hand. You want to go first? Um, like who the, what the user base would be? Like who am I selling this digital product to or who would be yeah, using it? That's, that's the, one of the first things you figure out. Yeah. So, um, so one of the things you said is figure out who is your persona or your target audience, right? What else do you need to figure out? Ben, I thought you might have raised your hand previously. Ian, go ahead. Um, another thing I was going to say is like what content would be on the, the, the page, for instance. And how would you um, think about that content? Like, how would you figure okay. out what content you want on there? Basically, depending on the user, look at what their interests are and then uh, show content based off that. So like a recommendation based system, if that makes sense, or if that yeah. sort, of sort of answers it. Yeah. And then are you actually looking to solve a problem for the user? Like, why are you doing this? Um, it would be more sort of build, it would be to build a platform that the user can use on a consistent basis, per se. I don't know if that necessarily answers the question. So you want the user to use it on a consistent basis. Are you going to figure out who your user is going to be? You're going to figure out how to serve them based on their interests. And how are you going to think about making money? Like at the end of the day, you know, the business wants to launch something. How would you think about that? Um, maybe ads. I don't know. If, I, I guess maybe running ads. Yeah, that's one way of monetizing for sure. So, and as you think about sort of what makes a digital product and why you should build it, there's several things that are sort of core elements of, of product management. And there are several words that get used to describe it, right? So there is figuring out what is the customer base, what's the persona, doing customer research, figuring out how do you measure success and actually using different software methodologies to put them out in production. And so product management is all these keywords and then more. Ian, do you have a point to make? It's your hand. Okay, perfect. Um, so as, as Ian's talking about thinking about what is the customer interested in, you have to sort of tie back to these core elements. And the core elements truly are uh, product management sits at the intersection of user design. So it's easy to use, it's simple, and that user design actually translates into broader customer experience. There's a side of the technology, which is how you're gonna build it. And then what is, how's the business gonna make money from, right? So you don't wanna produce something just cause it's fun. At the end of the day, it has to be funded. It has to get prioritized in um, the backlog of your organization. And then it has to meet the customer demands and actually make money for the organization. So while it's fun to think about problems that we're solving, the product management sits at the heart of it and it has to marry all these three elements to produce something. Um, we're gonna go a little bit deeper into all of these. So from the business side of the house, as Ian was talking about ads as a potential way of, of monetizing uh, the platform. So if we just take Instagram as an example, Instagram, people post pictures of what's happening in their life. People post products they're using. Instagram manages to understand all of that and produce very timely recommendations. And those recommendations then follow you through in different platforms you use. So for example, if you search for all birds shoes and that all birds ad will stalk you on Facebook and it'll stalk you on Instagram, right? So an all birds could be getting uh, if there's some sort of rev share model between all those and Instagram for every sale that, or every impression that goes through um, uh, to a full sale. And so there's 
market forces that Instagram needs to think about. Instagram is owned by Facebook, so Meta, uh, the organization, needs to think about what is their broader strategy? How are they thinking about customer analytics? How are you tying back to the business metrics? And then how are you actually engaging with the various people that are involved in launching your product? So when you are, so my experience only large organizations, I haven't had the privilege of working in um, startups or smaller organizations, but in large organizations, there's a lot of people involved because their reputational risk is very high. And especially in banks where um, banking and healthcare are two areas where we don't have the luxury of moving fast and breaking things. We have to move as purpose and solve problems because we're dealing with people's either medical records or you're dealing with people's finances. So their reputational risk is very, very high. And so you have to get things right. And so for that, there's a lot of checks and balances in larger organizations. So there's multiple stakeholders to bring along. And so there's the business side of product management that is, that is figuring out how do you make money? How do you figure out a strategy that um, you can actually deliver against? How do you measure that strategy? And then how do you make sure what you're building fits into the larger ecosystem of your organization? Then there is the actual technology, right? Which is uh, what we've been studying in school, like these are the things that you need to go build. So if you're building Instagram, um, it's a platform to Ian's point, and it's a platform that you want high reliability on. So it needs to be on um, infrastructure that is, you know, 99.9999% um, reliable, it's scalable, user base is growing gangbusters. So they need to have the data infrastructure ready to go. They need to have the tech infrastructure to be able to launch features with the speed at which they do. Um, so the architecture and intra decisions have to evolve with the growing needs of their customers and the growing needs of the competition. And a product manager who's probably embedded in the technology organization is driving this entire digital product process. So as a, a potential future product manager um, on this call, you would not only be thinking about all the things you need to do in tech to get your platform ready, but you would also be thinking about all the business things we've, we've talked about. And then you layer in the voice of the customer. What does the customer really, really want? What's the content design going to be? How is the interaction going to work? So if you just think about Instagram, right? Like how the news feed shows up, the fact that they use reels, uh, how those reels work. And a lot of people share TikTok and reels, you know, like it gets double posted. And if you think about influencers and how are they actually monetizing these platforms, there's a continuous product feedback loop that the product manager is getting and they can make iterations on it. So all of this is the field of product management. So it's very complex and by no means um, is it a simple undertaking. Uh, and so product organizations have different sort of fears and hierarchies of how people work together. So you have product owners that, for example, on Facebook, there would be just some you know, group of people that own just the newsfeed and they're thinking about the newsfeed every single day on how do I make the newsfeed more efficient? How do I pop the most relevant information? How do I make sure I'm keeping misinformation away? Um, the, and so a product owner then grows into a product manager, then grows into a product leader. And so your scope just grows with that. So let me pause. What questions do folks have? It's, it's a lot of content and we'll keep going through more, but let me just pause for comments or questions. All right, good. Angela, yeah, I want to make a comment. If you go back to the previous slides, remember in the early years of IST, we have IST triangle, which is like people, uh, information, and technology. And the, the, uh, the edges of the triangle looks just like this. You know, you have the human interaction, human computer interaction, you have the information technology, and then you have the uh, user aspect, I guess here, the user aspect is closely related to businesses. Actually, that's such a great point, Dr. Wang. I never thought about it, but you are spot on. Yeah. So the, the skill set needed to succeed in product is very much interdisciplinary, which is what the school produces. So um, that's such a great observation. So that's yeah. exactly our college's uh, philosophy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Because, you know, at the end of the day, people want to just build things, discuss, and it, it wouldn't work if the users don't actually want it, doesn't solve a problem, or if the business can't make money from it. Like, as technologists, we just want to, you know, uh, bring the most efficient solution and the fastest way of doing things, but it has to tie back to the user problem, it has to tie back to the business goals. 
Um, yeah, I'm going to remember that. That's a really great point. Thank you. Okay. All right, so I'm going to move us forward into like what I think are sort of the 10 steps to remember as you think about um, building a product. And I'm um, going to take the example of, let's not talk about Instagram or something like that. Just these are big companies that are organized, right? Let's take something simple. Um, let's say Angela sells beautiful jewelry, right? And I want to use, like, I'm, I, you know, I have this little Nexus on. I want to sell this piece of jewelry and I want to sell it. You know, it's a, it's a physical product, but I can sell it online, right? And so the 10 steps I'm going to talk about would sort of fit any digital product and also fit something as simple as I know, a piece of jewelry. At the end of the day, um, I need to figure out who is going to buy this beautiful pearl necklace, right? I need to figure out the user. Is it Dr. Wang? Is it Dr. Wang maybe buying it for somebody he adores? Or is it Angela buying for herself? In this case, my husband bought this for me. And so there's a product market fit for this specific necklace that, that was identified. Once that product market fit is figured out, you have to understand your customers through the use cases. I actually think that the jewelry example is not a good one for this because it this, you know, the pearl necklace kind of works on so many occasions. Um, let me switch gears a little bit. What is a good example? I'm going to talk about my hobby business. Okay. This story has never been shared. So it's the first time you all hear about it. Um, I had a hobby business maybe a decade ago where I started building um, uh, and selling uh, lotion and lip balms and like products that were focused on using clean ingredients and there were skincare products. And so I figured the product market fit was folks like myself who wanted to use clean ingredients in the product. Um, I, the pain point really was that this is this point, my experiment was 10 years ago. Um, there was no Whole Foods at every corner, you know, getting like uh, organic, natural lotion and soaps was not super, super accessible. And so the use case and the persona came out to be, it has to be easy, accessible, you have to be able to sell online, right? Um, the, I figured the target customer was somebody like myself in their late 20s to early 30s, looking to spend a decent amount of money on their skincare and looking to use clean ingredients and willing to pay a little bit of a premium for it. And um, the metrics that I defined as my success criteria was how many customers are actually going to ask about the product. And then the sale piece is of course where, you know, the rubber meets the road and you can, sell, you can gather how many people are interested in the product, how many actually buy the product, how many return the product, how much, are you, how much money are you making? But if you think about it, I'm trying to do this online, right? So if I'm selling online, there's a website that can do a lot of tracking for us, which I think you all might be studying about in any case. So Google Analytics, for example, what are the search words that people are searching for? What signs are they searching for it? What are the, what are the keywords that actually generate uh, the highest return for me? So what is the click to conversion ratio? What is the um, best sort of search engine key phrases to use in trying to get my product displayed in a certain way on the website and, and does equally translate it to a click that somebody goes by and goes and buys it. So there's, pro there's metrics that I can use to measure the customer interaction and their experience, right? So for example, when a customer is trying to understand what I'm selling, they're on a web page. Um, it might be an Amazon web page. Amazon has very strong guidelines for their sellers, and they do a great job of how to display the product, what type of descriptions to put in. But assume I'm not going through any of that. I built my own website. I'm, I'm building my own. I'm an ISP student. I actually did build my own website. And then, um, you know, this WordPress has amazing options of adding shopping carts and like you can there's just plug and play apis that you can build all this, this stuff through and so what is at what point am i actually taking the customer's interest from the time they discover my product understand it to putting into their cart and to actually getting it that is not the entire experience the entire experience is when it gets delivered to them they open it and they can actually use the product and they like it 
right? So when I think about product management, it's the end-to-end journey from the time the customer discovers the product and they actually use it. And all those things that happen in between, as a product manager, you need to think about. So in our last example, we were talking about a digital product. And in this case, I'm using a website to sell the product, but it's a physical product. And so I had a situation where one of the things I sent leaked in the shipping container. And of course, the customer was upset and then gave me feedback. And oh my God, that became my problem to solve now that I have to ship this the right way and I have to have the right feel on the lotion bottle because that matters for customer experience. And if you translate that into any sort of digital product, your customer, and you know, I do, I've done digital banking for a decade now. So from the time you open a bank account with any bank to actually using the bank and how you get your statement and what happens when you log into the mobile app and can you actually access your funds when you need to? What happens when you get an overdraft? What happens when you have an issue and you're waiting on the phone for hours? All those things are what a, custom, what a product manager should be thinking about, right? So the reason I say it's a very complex field is based on the product that you're building and selling, even if it happens to be in the banking world, the set of problems you uncover are very different. So how you build a credit card uh, product is very different from how you build a checking account product and how you build a, you know, something that's like selling a lotion or how you build Instagram, a very different product. But the fundamentals of the 10 things we're talking about here are going to remain the same. Um, let me pause. I have a few more things to go through, but I want to know if there's questions or thoughts as we're going through this. Go ahead. So I always like to take a little of the devil's advocate view on things to uh, challenge a little bit. And uh, it's one of the things I try to bring out of my students. And you've been talking about the profit motive and the business angle of products. But I would argue that there are a considerable number of products out there that have no profit motive whatsoever. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of my areas of research is the prepper community. Uh, you know, it's an interesting community because, you know, a lot of people think of the crazies that are stockpiling 5 million rounds of ammunition and, you know, crazy stuff like that. But there's a considerable subset that's just really about preparedness and information sharing of, you know, how to use technology to control your solar arrays to filter your water, to do so many of these things. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on products that don't necessarily fit the model. You know, I mean, I know we're all good capitalists and we like to make lots of money and everything, but there are a considerable number of products, I would argue, that don't have a profit motive. There's no intention in that area whatsoever. Do you think that substantially changes the structure of how that product develops? Uh, how it's organized? Does it have an impact on some of these things you yeah, uh, are talking question. about? I'd like to just throw that out for a thought piece and get your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. And so if I think about, yeah, uh, so there definitely are, I mean, there's lots of nonprofits out there, right? And they, they are not motivated by, uh, by actual profits. Um, I do think when I talk about the business side, there's the, you know, there's the high, how do you meet the how do you monetize and all that? But then also what's the business problem you're looking to solve, right? So if we think about um, like Kiva, for example, Kiva is a microfinance, um, it's a micro loan provider based in San Francisco. They provide loans globally to, um, to farmers, to artisans uh, all over the globe who are in need of those micro loans, right? So for something like we can donate $5 and that translates to hundreds of something in another currency, and that makes a difference for that person for their livelihood, right? And so Kiva is a nonprofit, not motivated by making money, but definitely motivated by solving their business mission and their business goal, which is to provide uh, means of um, lending to certain types of you know, organizations in the world, right? So I think when I think about the business box in this, it's more around um, elements that, tie back to the problem statement you're solving. So I, you know, in the example of preparedness, the, that group is looking to make sure that, you know, their audience is thinking about things that they may not be thinking about. So in the case of, you know, a bank application, at the end of the day, we want convenience for our end user. We want them to be able to log into their mobile phone to look at their account or go to the website or go to a branch, right? Um, 
so not everything has a monetary motive 100 percent right uh, but the way i think about it is it has the work that you build has to tie back to some sort of a goal. And that goal in a nonprofit organization is to serve their end constituents. In the case, the example that you talked about was you know, a set of users that are looking for the right information. Does that help? Yes, uh, you know, I, I, I guess the way I was thinking of it is that rather than to you know, throw it into the pure business, it's really a value proposition kind of a scenario that you're talking about. And, you know, I. I was in the Air Force for 30 years. You know, a lot of the things that we had, it was very difficult to put a dollar value on. It was hard to assess that value proposition. Most people from a common sense standpoint would say that has great value. You know, we don't want to be overrun. We don't want to have insecurity in our, uh, you know, flight systems. We don't want all these things to happen, but putting a dollar value on it. And so the, the thing that triggered this whole question was when you were talking about your success indicators and measurement. And I think this is a much more complex, you know, dollars and cents are easy, right? You make a profit you have a loss, right? You know, you're, you're good, you're bad. It's kind of almost a binary condition. But, you know, in some of these things where it brings value that makes somebody's life better, how do you put a, you know, value proposition on that? A digital voice assistants helping the other able, you know, exactly. that, you know, yeah. can't move, you know, those type of things. I think that was, that was an element of it that I, I, I just like to bring that out because I really do like my students to think about that in terms of value proposition, not necessarily dollars and cents. So Yeah, yeah, so the metrics you could, could also be around automation. They could be around, there's like a whole litany of metrics you could think about, right? Like from the time uh, the customer starts using the product, how long is it taking? Like if you just get a new iPhone, as an example, the whole unboxing experience for that Apple produced, that itself can be measured. How long does it take for them to open the box? What's that experience like? Are they loving that experience or not? So I think there's a this, the topic of metrics is very broad. There's metrics on user experience. What is the customer behavior? Um, when you're scrolling on a web page, where do you pause and where do you get stuck? Like even those things can be measured so that, uh, that the set of metrics that you would produce on your product are very broad from compliance, tech, the, the, the profit and loss piece, the actual experience for the customer, and then there's intangibles, the sheer fact that you get a, you know, all everybody here that, that talked about their products, they have a high NPS score, which is, that means they love it, right? And they love it for a reason. So it's, that is highly intangible. Um, and so you can't really put a number on it, but the fact that the customer loves your product means more customers will love it and that you're, you're solving a problem for them. So you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a broader set. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. So for some of the non, non dollar a month things can you ask customer to say if i enable this how much are you willing to pay let's say use the willing to, willingness to pay to simulate the dollar value for that yeah what i have seen um done is the the so there's many ways to play it right so if i'm trying to figure out pricing on a product I can ask the customer, I can do a pilot, right? For like three months and say, hey, use this product for free. How much are you willing to pay, right? That, that's one way of doing it. But then more so if like, um, like if you think about just as an example, Google Maps, I'm a huge Google Maps fan. I feel like they've just done just a phenomenal job of making information easy to find. And because I use it more and I have discovered other features. And so you, that is value to Google as well, because I'm not going to use an Apple Maps product. I'm using Google Maps for everything. I'm using it for directions, but I'm also looking to find sushi restaurants. I'm also looking to plan my road trips. I'm also downloading it for my offline maps, right? And they have access to all my data and my transaction patterns, and they get a thumbs up for me, but I cannot say the same thing for Apple Maps. So from a standpoint, from Google's standpoint, they have more retention of the user and their my attention span is with Google. Uh, while, you know, in terms of how somebody at Google is translating that, there's most definitely somebody thinking about Angela's, um, you know, behavior on Google and how they can make money off it, right? Because I'm also using Google for my search engine. I'm not using Bing, I'm not using Safari. Um, so I think that metrics get measured differently on the type of sort of product that you're building. 
Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Sam. Angela, we have a question in the Q&A from Kanan, and I can read it for you if you can't see it. I'm happy to do that. Um, he asks, earlier you mentioned keywords to use on search platforms for your products to show up. Any suggestions on where to research and find these keywords? Yeah, so it's a great point. And I think it's just a little bit from, a, like, if I just think back to um, my own, when I had, you know, my, the, I created this thing called Moksha Naturals, which was a natural based product. And what I did was I studied the market. I studied what's the competition out there. I studied, you know, that like, people were producing lavender lotion because it's easy to do. You put lavender essential oil, lavender essential oil is the cheapest, mint essential oil is the cheapest. So I figured out what the market is, who's selling the product, how, what's the price point. So there's no substitute for research on that area. Um, and then how are they marketing and advertising their work, right? So there is no specific resource that comes to mind, like, except like, you know, Google what you are looking to build and see how else somebody else is doing it. Um, if you end up using Google Analytics or, um, you know, as you build your own web website to WordPress, there's analytics tools that are available that would actually suggest search engine terms of the type of things you're looking to sell. So I don't have a specific tool in mind except utilizing like, the common things that are out there. All right, so let me keep going on a couple of other things I have and then um, we'll talk some more. So as so we talked about the metrics piece and metrics go very, very broad. One of the things I would say is that I've seen as a success um, factor is the fact that you come up with a hypothesis and do some testing around and build a feedback loop before you actually go scale up. So in the case of banking, you know, um, I, I can't launch a product to millions of customers. I have to test out with a small user base. And similarly, folks here are, are consumers of Instagram, of Amazon, of all these, you know, of Google, like all the tech companies that are out there, we all use them. And they're doing experiments every single day. So for example, if you use the Amazon app, as much as I do, you might notice that the placement of certain icon changes from time to time. And so it's like in the same household, if my husband and I are both logged into the Amazon app, we might actually see a different layout. Um, and so they're doing experiments and building a feedback loop on what is the best way for us to take a certain action. So coming up with what is the hypothesis and then validating and doing A-B testing, it's A-B testing stands for basically someone sees A and someone sees B and you see what the reaction, right? And you can use that A-B testing methodology for so many different things. You can test it, use it for testing price points. You can test it for using what's the easiest way for somebody to um, take the action. Um, like I'll give you one specific example. Um, I feel like on, on Facebook, their privacy features have come a long way in the last decade. Like a decade ago, if you wanted to set your privacy settings, it was extremely painful, and now they've made it a lot easier. And that, of course, has been through a series of feedback. And if you go to any of these sort of feature pages, you might see a thumbs up and a thumbs down button. And that's a quick way of the, you know, of a user to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down, like almost equivalent to when you're watching Netflix and you say, yes, you like this movie, and you give it a thumbs up. Right, so Netflix then records, this is a great recommendation. And so going forward, I can give you something similar. So this is one way of building the loop. Um, building out your most basic minimum viable pro uh, product and getting feedback on it. So as I started building out, I go back to my lip balms and my lotions, friends and family were the best to get feedback on, right? Like, um, for example, somebody didn't like the scent, somebody didn't like the color, somebody didn't like uh, how it feels on my hands. And there were things that were super hit. So you get feedback along the way. And so same thing as I built my website on WordPress, I got feedback from my friends on what colors would work, how would the wireframes work, what, what's the best way of getting a customer to understand what I'm trying to do here. And so in the case of a nonprofit like Kiva, uh, their MVP could be something along the lines of how easy is it for the person I'm trying to get the micro loan for easy to get them in there bank account right but from the time the user donates five dollars what has to happen all the way for that five dollars to then show up in the micro lender uh the person receiving the loan in their account so the entire process has to be built and that includes all the tech aspects the business aspects the ux aspects and all the legal risk compliance things 
So all the end-to-end things that I've talked about is like the, one of the most important things to remember. That's where all the gotchas are. That's where things will go south. Um, it's always the fringe scenarios that sort of get you when you scale up. Because um, you might not think about the fringe scenarios when you're doing your MVP, but as you scale, organizations tend to uh, move to the next shiny object. So you might have features that are incomplete out there and then as a result, the customer experience is not that great. There are different methodologies that are used for building out the product itself, Agile, Scrum, Kanban, there's several software development methodologies. Um, so now that you've got your product built, there's a go-to-market strategy. Uh, this is a physical external phasing product. And then there's a launch plan, right? So, um, so if I just talk about what has been a public launch lately. Uh, if there are any Peloton users on the call, um, this morning, Peloton launched a new product called Peloton Guide. And I got an email basically saying, hey, there's a new product we've launched and here's what it does, right? So somebody figured out this is one way of communicating to the users, um, sending an email out, explaining what we do, adding a video to it, um, of course, then describing all the benefits and what's the value prop to the end user, which is, hey, you can do all your home workouts on your Peloton, on your TV, you don't have to have a gym membership. So somebody figured out this entire go to market strategy and plan and then actually rolled out the product. The, uh, oh, sorry. So, and then once you have something out there, getting feedback and consistency, iterating is the only way to survive and succeed. But these 10 steps can be applied to any type of um, you know, product you wanna launch, whether it's a t-shirt company, whether it's a jewelry store or a competitor to Instagram. Um, and they're broad enough. Um, but then as you get into the details, you'd have to think about how specific these points would be to your work. So let me pause. What questions, comments, thoughts do folks have? All right, let me pick on someone. Um, Abby, Abigail. Hi, yeah, do you see this working for smaller companies like startups as well as big companies or are there certain steps that you think are not fit for both types of companies? Yeah, that's a great question, Abigail. So um, I have not had an experience in smaller organizations, but my hypothesis is that they would be using most of these steps, but they may be moving much faster than the larger organizations because um, you don't have to get that many people along for the journey. But I would be surprised if you're skipping over any of these. Or you might call them something different, right? Like, so, um, like, as we go in the presentation, I talk about different books that you can read. And there are most definitely just words that are getting used differently, but they have the same concept. So as you go from one organization to the next, the broader team might remain the same, but they might be just called something else. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Cameron. Uh, hi, I was just wondering, what are some common challenges you could face when trying to complete these 10 steps? So many. I feel like every step has its set of challenges, but that's also where the fun is. Um, I think getting the product market fit right, the first one is the most important one, because if you end up building something that nobody wants, it's just, you're going to make the news. So one example um, I'll talk about that is fairly a public example is, um, it's been a while now, I think in the early 2000s, Microsoft acquired Nokia and Microsoft wanted to put out a phone. And you know, 20 years later, uh, most people have iPhones, they don't have a Microsoft phone, right? So the product market fit for that specific acquisition and how they imagined it would play out and the phone they would put out with Microsoft with the acquisition didn't achieve the results they wanted. And that was a very public write-off when Satya Nadeva came you know, as, as uh, the CEO. And so I think there were billions and I definitely could be wrong. On, I'm definitely wrong on the number because I don't remember the exact number, but there was a pretty public facing loss. Um, and so that's an example of where it wasn't the right 
product market fit or you know, strategy wasn't thought about, but you have to start with getting that right. And for that itself, you might have to do experiments. Um, the challenges evolved as you go through the process. Like for example, when you, in number six on this point, when you start putting out your pilot and you are doing a prototype, you might just get so much feedback um, that you have to figure out how much feedback can you accommodate before you go to scale. In large organizations, there's always a shortage of budget and capacity. And so there's always trade-offs of what can get delivered. There's 20 projects, five can get done, which five will get done. And that, ha that is true for any large organization. Um, and so how do you prove out the value of the program while you're going to pilot is another challenge that's sort of seen across the board. So I have a related question. I have a related question, Angela. In a large organization, many teams want resources, right? So how do they compete for resources? Do they write a proposal for their projects? Great question, Dr. Wang. And 100%, uh, always competition for resources. And there is a, you know, it's almost a race to, it's, there is, so organizations do it differently, right? Like Amazon is known for a very strong writing culture and folks write out the entire very heavy data-driven proposal of what's needed, which is actually um, a Word document versus a PowerPoint slide. So every organization does it differently, but most definitely uh, it, the proposal has to include what business problem are you solving? What user problem are you solving? How long will it take you to build? And how does it fit into the strategy of the entire company? And how does it tie back to the business goals? Um, once you even have that, you know, set of like resourcing assigned, as you build, you'll uncover capacity constraints, um, gotchas, because some part of the organization may be on an old tech stack and you want to build on a new tech stack. You might have dependency on some common platforms. And so every sort of, there's processes for reprioritization and capacity management on an ongoing basis. So um, most companies I work with have scaled agile um, methodology implemented. And that means there is a group of folks who help with capacity management and there's processes built in the system, in the organization for sprint grooming, planning, which is, having foresight in what is it that you want to build and how many you know, team members are going to build it. So there's a continuous planning process and continuous negotiation for those resources as well. Great question. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna keep going. Um, next few pages are more for information sharing and I've taken just what I have seen out in the in industry as uh, points for folks to sort of think about and read up if there's interest in the topic. There's lots of great books out there, but you hear these phrases around design thinking and lean startup and agile, and they are sort of interrelated. The, um, the point that I was really looking to make was that you have to combine all these methodologies to have something that's meaningful. And, and you're, you know, you're going from understanding the customer. So uh, you know, I talked about Kiva and Kiva's user base are twofold. They are providing an option to folks who want to make a donation, right? So there's the donor who can go online and donate $5. And then there's the user who is receiving those $5 um, to then go build, you know, baskets or, uh, you know, um, sue something like, for example, like the, my God, what's called, um, build a tailoring business. And so the users are two types of users in this. And so you understand from doing customer research, what is it they want? And you move from sort of empathizing into then actually ideating and defining what you want to build. And then in lead startup, you end up doing a lot more experiments, iterative experiments, before you actually get it into this agile backlog here. And so to, you, to Dr. Wang, your point on resourcing, what I was trying to say is that these agile processes also then include capacity management um, on an ongoing basis, because at the beginning, set of resources get assigned, but then people get pulled into different things or your scope expands, which uh, as you uncover through going through those 10 steps, your scope can change because you might not have thought about certain, like in banking, there's a lot of rules and regulations and how those rules and regulations apply to specific scenarios is a very 
uh, in-depth sort of conversations and so you might uncover more things. And so a lot of product managers are actually just figuring things out. It's before you get into this customer solution phase, this continuous iteration is where the magic's truly made. This is where you figure out what is it that you want to build and how you want to build it, and then you actually go build it. So this is very hard to do in large organizations um, because of the scale at which they operate. And um, to, I don't remember who asked the question about startups. This is where startups succeed um, and can do so much because they can iterate very quickly, right? Because you don't have to go through lots of levels of process to do this. You can get feedback from your customers right away and make changes right away. Right? You shrink that loop from the time you get the customer feedback to actually executing on the feedback to honestly a matter of days or minutes based on how quickly you can get your tech action changed. Um, here's a few books that um, I recommend on um, product management. The one that I have had an opportunity to read uh, more in depth is Inspired, and I got an opportunity to actually attend Marty Kagan, his class, and that's one of my favorite ones. There's tons of books that you can just search on Amazon. But these are the few that over the course of sort of just studying the field, the ones that I've enjoyed, and every, every one of these has different flavor um, and talks about the how do you build something that your customers really, really love. Uh, the one by Marty, and I found this image. Oh, why is it not working? Yeah, sorry, go back. Yeah, the one by Marty Kagan. Uh, I found this awesome medium post, and uh, you know, credit to this person who put it out here. And they, Mar he's talking about what's the value prop to to uh, the point earlier made, and what exactly, what's the problem that we're looking to solve. Who are we solving it for? What's the target market? What's the size of the opportunity? How big is it? And what metrics will you measure? How will you measure success? And are there any you know, alternates out there? So this sort of value prop canvas, I think makes life very easy to think about. As this is a framework that I think you can apply to the product. And um, this does not actually include the tech solution. The tech solution is something you're going to build. But this is the what, why, how, and assessing the sort of the product opportunity and defining what can you build that the customer will love and that's useful and feasible and valuable to them. So I thought this was a very nice way of representing how to think about a new product. Um, and I feel like I've been in the field for a while and every single day I still learn something new and it's a very hard field to be in because there's so many gotchas, you know? And the more experience you have, the more sort of you realize that um, wish we could change this or wish we could change that. So one other book that I want to recommend that Google in introduced um, is, is basically called Design Sprints. And um, I think Jake Knapp was um, at Google and he experimented this and then they wrote a book about it. Now it's in the industry and a lot of organizations are looking to pick it up. And this is Going back to our former slide where there's a continuous iteration loop and you're building and testing with the customer, and then you go actually build. This is shrinking that down to a five-day period where you can actually map out a prototype with the customer and then go build. So you can put a map and sketch it out. You can get their feedback, redesign, and test all within five days. For large institutions, this is most definitely a boon because it does shrink a lot of the feedback loop. So you're not building something that no one's going to use and interact with. I also think even for startups, this is going to be a, this is a great way of getting quick customer feedback on what you should build and how you should build. So these are some of the few books I, I recommend. And so one of the things that I definitely have thought about at length is what is, what is the best way to define this, right? And so... Um, this is like truly just my definition of uh, product management is like you have to be able to find valuable customer insights and provide feasible solutions with that end-to-end -end thinking of mine. Like think about all the things that can go wrong. Like somebody asked a question on challenges. There's so many things that can go wrong and you can only, you know, fix them um, so much before you actually scale up. So like when I talked about my... Um, natural lotion product lines, like I didn't think about 
how the star could leak in a shipping container and that's a bad customer experience. Because to me, I was just so excited about building the thing and building the website. But that was the end to end that I was missing. And now I take that and I apply it to like a large uh, banking platform or I apply that to Instagram. Like this every day, there's stories out there about disinformation and how, um, you know, the tech platforms we use, somebody didn't think about something. And so that's what makes it feel very complex because there's unintended consequences for the things we build. So a great example is you might, you know, the customer might find a different use for the product you build. Um, and that's how your product might become popular. And that may be a positive unintended consequence, or it could be a negative unintended consequence. So thinking about all these things with that lens is what product management is truly about. Uh, but my goal sort of today was really to walk you all through um, a little bit of, um, you know, framework for how to think about it. But let me pause. There's like maybe one other content slide I want to cover before we, um, before we open up for more questions. Are there more questions or thoughts? Next. So your unintended consequences comment, uh, I'm wondering if you're seeing a move in industry that's really addressing that. You know, you think about, you know, I wonder if uh, Zuckerberg, when he was sitting in his dorm room, ever had any idea of the, you know, incredible chaos that his platform was causing because he envisioned one use and didn't think about how other groups might use that. Do you see a trend in industry uh, putting more emphasis on that because I personally do not. It seems like getting to market and getting the money flowing has really dominated the theme. But, you know, you think about a lot of the products, uh, I'll pull up electric cars is the concept. Everybody touts all the good elements, you know, carbon footprint reduction, things like this, but they don't talk about some of the potential downsides of rare earth mineral, you know, in some of these nations that have them being exploited, environmental impacts of doing that, battery disposal. You know, they only tout the, you know, the, the positives and it seems to be a trend that just continues to be in a do loop in industry at large. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how do you solve that? How do you get people to think about those second, you know, because, you know, they're always wanting to accentuate the positives, but there are considerable negatives, you know, involved here. And, you, you know, you just look at, you know, even Starbucks can't just serve you a cup of coffee anymore. They got to think about the paper container it came in, you know, comes in, how many trees that kills a year. Uh, is it reusable? You know, the metallic straw, you know, movement that ended up being a big bust. Uh, you know, there are so many of these things out there. And I just wonder, have you seen any evidence of a move in that direction? Or is it just an accepted cost of business that has been a, we'll deal with it later and, and move on? Yeah, I think that's a great point i do think organizations are being more mindful from an environmental and social standpoint right does you see all this news about um a lot of money being set aside for climate action um like for example i don't remember the exact numbers for jp morgan but that's for sure there's a set budget set aside for esg related Items. So I do see it as a trend in the industry across industries where there's a focus on ESG, environmental and sustainability. How that translates into actual action, I'm just not exposed to it. It's not my field of study. Um, I do think the action though, like for example, um, recently I was watching a documentary on fast fashion and Patagonia, uh, the CEO of Patagonia, Yvonne Chouinard is notably vocal um, on uh, retailers not doing enough for exploiting the environment, exploiting you know, certain parts of the country, uh, certain parts of the world for cheaper labor, uh, for cheaper supply chain, and, um, and how you know, Patagonia, for example, is, doing, is investing more in sustainability and using organic cotton, and there's all these things they're doing. But that's, so I feel like there's very few examples of outstanding contributions like that. 
uh, though every organization, like from the Walmarts to the Amazons to uh, even the smaller companies are looking to be more ESG friendly because the consumer wants that, right? So I don't know how much it is really driven by the businesses versus if they're responding to what their consumer wants. Like as a, you know, as a startup who was doing this natural lotion business for like a little bit, I had the option of putting on my website that I will donate to a company that will plant a tree for you. And so there are companies that do that. And as a small business, I put that on my website and it resonated with my audience. And so, but I didn't physically plant the tree. I gave money to an organization that says they would plant a tree. I have no idea where that tree is really planted. So I do think there are tools out there. Um, and so the trend is towards more eco-friendly um, uh, and more climate friendly pledges. How those pledges translate to action, I just don't know enough on the field. But it's a great point to think about the carbon footprint. Like that's one that I personally would love to study a little bit more is like we use technology day in and every out. Like, you know, I live in breed technology. So do many people here. And what's the carbon footprint of the data centers? Like, I just don't know. Go ahead, Dr. Rank. Sorry, we were trying to jump in. No, it's okay. Okay. So, um, I don't know how much time I have, but I have a, maybe a couple more meaningful slides to cover. Um, so if Dr. Wang or Pam, if you can nudge me, if yeah. I'm going too long, just let me know. All right. So um, I was talking about, um, you know, all the things that we talked about was the 10 things of basically how you would build a product. And the one way of translating all that strategy into actual action and execution is this framework that I'm gonna talk you through. And these might be words that you know, can be loaded and they can mean different things in different contexts, but let me talk about it from context of, of um, uh, the best way to sort of draw the line here is you've got a company with a mission, right? And then they develop a vision, they develop business objectives. So in a, um, bank, it might be, hey, we want to provide financial services to everybody. Our vision is everyone has access to a bank account and the services associated. Now you break that down further, there's different types of users, right? There could be large companies that are using banks, there are small businesses that are using banks, there's the average and neat consumers that are using banks. And so based on that business unit, you might have specific goals of, hey, we want to make sure that you know, a customer is logging in 10 times a month and just making it up. That could be one objective, right? Or And that objective could really mean if they're logging in 10 times a month, that means they're actually using my product and they're engaged. So to somebody's earlier point on, you know, like the Instagram, TikTok, WhatsApp, and the um, Snapchat of the world, they are addictive because they have exactly figured out if I can get you to stay on my app and can keep you scrolling, you are inevitably going to look at the ads, which will drive back to my business goals. So every action the user is taking drives back to the business goal and that drives back to their vision and mission. So, and I don't know those orgs closely to know that. But the top half of this page is basically truly where, where it's the strategy and how you're thinking about broadly. And the bottom half is how you execute on it. So when you have that business goal figured out, then you go right, you know, once you figure out what is that you want to build, you actually, the bottom half is how you, do development in the agile process. So there's, you break down the work into epics and features and you write stories and tasks and then tie back that task to the key result. I think I actually do have an example. Um, hold on. My, I have an explicit example where, oh, sorry. Um, I'm just gonna go here to this page. Okay, so it's gonna come out later in the deck, but let me just go back here. So as you sort of think, oops, sorry, what happened, did I lose this? Okay. So if you think about this translating strategy into action, there's, um, there's several points of failure that come up. One of which is there's unrealistic roadmaps and unrealistic commitments. It was, you know, to the point of this, it's way too much to be done than there's capacity. And because these are really larger teams, um, there's limited trust and there's unclear sort of sense of roles and responsibilities. The interaction models aren't defined. 
Um, and then there is you no know, sort of central tools of how you would manage the product features. And there's undisciplined agile development to, to some extent. So these are, you know, this sort of slide on failure points can be applied to any type of organization, whether it's a small startup or whether it's um, a big organization when you're trying to launch something and there's a lot of people involved. And what this translates really into is like dysfunctional lead teams basically lead to missed targets. And whether that target is financial or whether it is an intangible of the customer saying, we love the product, you're gonna miss those. And so how do you sort of go about um, solving these basic problems? And the most common one is starting out with clear definitions of roles and responsibilities, having very clear communication models, uh, having the disciplinary rigor of, of actually falling through on your agile methodology, and then keeping up with the product management hygiene, which is you know, the stories that you write, that is what is actually going to be built, is written with the right set of, it has all the details, it accounts for all the non-functional requirements, uh, you're not changing the scope, so actually sticking with a good process makes a difference. The reason hygiene is very important is because that's where people will get lost and you will add more time into your development process and not put something out to market faster because people are caught up with dealing with poorly written JIRA stories, dealing with poorly uh, written testing examples. So the entire process of one through 10 is actually happening with a lot of people involved in the five people in larger organizations. And so as a result, keeping up with these sort of five things here would be very, very beneficial in uh, translating your strategy into action. Um, so I talk about product management hygiene and what the one point of feedback that I've gotten over the years is, you know, if I'm an agile, that means I've, I want to move fast. Uh, why do I really need to plan? And to the point that I made earlier, and Dr. Wang was asking about resources, continuous planning is what you really, really need because you're going to end up having a lot of people that are involved. And so you'll have a product manager, you'll have a designer, you'll have an engineering person, you'll have multiple developers, you'll have stakeholders that are shared. And so bringing that sort of group of people together on what you're going to build, where are all the dependencies, what are you looking to actually test out and what decisions you need, reminding everybody of, of what we're building and why we're building gives everybody a seat at the table of actually being able to influence. So I'm a big believer of diverse teams because at the end of the day, your, your customer base is very diverse, a big believer of making sure there's multiple points of view so you can get the best product um, um, out the door. So product planning for smallish teams is fairly easy. When it comes to larger groups, and when you have multiple people involved, and it's not just you know one team of feature, the feature team, you have anywhere from 10 to 15 feature teams, each of them has anywhere from eight to 10 developers, and all of a sudden looking at 200 people that are involved in the program. So how do you plan for that? And so all the front part of this presentation was all the strategy, and now the rubber's meeting road, and you're actually building something, and you have all these people you need to bring along in your journey. And so when you're doing that, you're working across time zones, you're working across cultures, you're working across geographies. And so the discipline, the rigor, the communication models, um, the PM hygiene become even more important because you're not talking to these people every single day, you're relying on the tools like Ajira, which is a software used for managing software development. Um, and so the processes that the company has set up would make a big difference in sort of how you manage that. And then how do you actually build a product roadmap? So let me, um, before I go, get into this, are there questions? All right, I'm gonna keep going. Sorry, was somebody trying to chime in? I, I yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry, someone was saying something. Oh, imagine that. I uh, hit a button inadvertently, sorry. I was uh, dealing with a classroom management issue, sorry. Oh, no worries at all. Okay. So um, basically talking about now in the next few pages on based on the maturity of your program, how would you do product planning? And now you've got to imagine there's like 200 people on your program and you're trying to launch something together. So how are you keeping everybody on the same page? And it starts out with you actually have a roadmap and you distribute what these are called feature cards 
which has the name of the product manager, what is the feature they're looking to build, what is the benefit of the work, how long will it take, how does it tie back to our business goals? So I'm gonna have, I have an example here. So this example is, um, imagine there is an equivalent of, let's say it's Facebook, I mean, it's just a hypothetical example. There's a product manager named Samantha, who's on Team Wonder Woman. She wants to introduce a feature called One Click Privacy. And very simple, by one click, you know how Amazon has like the one click buy button, like you can just hit buy right away. One click privacy setting is her vision of what she wants to do. And that means across the board and Facebook has multiple, you know, there's the mobile app, there's also, they also own Instagram, they also own WhatsApp. And so if the user can have one way of setting their privacy across the platforms, that's what she wants to build. The benefit is it gives the user transparency, it helps them, you know, it, it makes it easier to follow the privacy regulations. Uh, someone named Susie from compliance has requested this. So they're going back to the fact that you have multiple stakeholders involved and understanding what the stakeholder needs are outside of your customer needs would also be important. They estimate it's going to take three sprints or six weeks. This is the PI increment to which they can actually deliver. Tying back to the business vision, which is creating a safer network world, tying back to the business goal. And to the point of metrics earlier, so if you can have a simple feature like one-click privacy, will it help increase user retention? And can you put a number on it? So she's got a goal of saying, I can drive up to 10% user retention, but only when that feature is active and live, you can actually test that, that, you know, um, and test sort of the metrics. Um, and you have dependencies on various teams. So Imagine you have 200 people in the room and this level of detail is available for what you want to build and how you want to build it and the dependencies between all these things. Because what happens is in large group um, is you put together a product roadmap, but that product roadmap can only get delivered with good execution. So if I have a vision of building a product like Instagram and there's no way I can do it on my own for sure, right? Like I just don't have that skill set. But if it's being done in a large organization, there'll be lots of product managers involved who own different components of it. Somebody owns um, the heart icon, somebody owns the engagement on the reels, somebody owns the, um, you know, the links that appear for shopping and what the influence experience is. So getting all this organized in a way that somebody can pick up and understand will help in the actual execution of it. And so what I think a lot of people really don't think about or understand when they think about product management is it's just a lot of uh, you know hard work but at the end of the day everything is about customer experience so from the time that the customer starts using instagram or they use a banking product or they you know um sign up to get go for a doctor's appointment like you name it like every single thing that a customer is doing and experiencing in your product that's what is the holy grail they don't care about how it's done right at the end of the day when we use snapchat or tiktok or insta it's about it just has to work and it has to give me what i'm looking for and so all these things that happen behind the scenes you don't think about every day but there's somebody thinking about elements of it and so while the field of product management is uh, it's a hot field and a lot of people want to be in this field. It's just hard work and grit and only 2% of it is actually very sexy. When you're building things out, you're putting in production, you're like getting flashy responses, you get all the marketing, but behind the scenes, there's just grit, pure grit that you need to get through. And um, I think like my purpose today was to give everybody a glimpse of what is the field of product management. And this is again, my favor of it, but um, I'm open to any questions, feedback, thoughts, and I've just personally enjoyed the questions so far because it's made me think about things differently as well. So I think that is the end of my presentation. Thank yeah. you, Angela. And uh, now we have like two minutes for questions. Uh, I think in the chat, there was a question from Shivaram. What would be a measurement of user retention? So, um, one way to measure it would be, so if you think about like just Instagram, the time one spends scrolling on the Instagram newsfeed, that is a metric of, of engagement, right? And now if I decide to instead spend all my time on Reels, which is just the next icon over in the Instagram app, 
um, that means my my engagement has dropped on looking at the pictures, but now spending more time on the videos. And so depending, depending on how you define user retention, user retention is also defined on, like if I just delete my Instagram app and not use it, they have lost me as a user. So you can define retention in many ways. You can define it by uh, each specific feature or the broader concept of just, you know, like at some point there was this delete Facebook movement and a lot of people deleted the app or deleted Uber because there was a movement. So that is also measured. It's also a sort of phrase used for measuring retention. Great question. Thank you. Maybe we'll take one last question. Anybody want to jump in with a question? Okay. I don't see a question. So thank, thank you again, Angela, for a great talk. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, there was a comment, though. Uh, I do not have a question, but I just want to say thank you for having this and for presenting this. It was a great presentation. Okay, oh. great. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Please, please find me on LinkedIn if you have more questions. Happy to connect. All the best to you all.